if you're not going to get me across, then you just have to forget me. I'll forget you. <laughs> you forget me. Hi everyone, I'm Dom Griffin. I'm a film critic and you're watching The Armchair Auteur, an ongoing video series where I talk about movies on the internet. If you're the kind of person that is into film culture and movies and stuff like that and you want to watch a guy talk about them endlessly every week, you should consider subscribing. Today we're going to be reviewing a film called The Wanting Mare from uh, debut director Nicholas Ash Bateman. Uh, it is also produced by primer filmmaker Shane Carruth. The Wanting Mayor uh, debuted this weekend at the Chattanooga Film Festival and also won an award for the best picture there. Uh, and it is a really strange sort of urban fantasy film uh, shot on a very low budget. Uh, and it's one of the most beautiful movies I've seen all year. Now, I myself, most of my interest in this film comes from the fact that Shane Carruth is listed as a producer. And last week, Shane Carruth did an interview with uh, film critic Robert Daniels talking about The Wanting Mayor since he's listed as a producer uh, that sort of spiraled into him talking about film in general and his career and when we're going to see another movie from him, if he's going to retire, lots of stuff. I will link the two interviews uh, down below in the description. And while it stoked my imagination and reminded me about how much I like Shane Carruth and how exciting he was as a filmmaker when he first hit on the scene uh, and how kind of depressing it is that he's like not been able to keep making the films he really wants to make, it made me wonder, well, if he doesn't have the time or the resources to be able to make a feature himself, uh, the fact that there's a new movie that he put his stamp of approval on this way must mean that something about it is special. And uh, it is. Nicholas Ash Bateman uh, started out as a visual effects guy. Uh, he worked for a few years on Chuck Hank and the San Diego Twins, a film that still is not out, uh, from director Evan Gladell, who you may remember as being the filmmaker behind the movie Bellflower. Uh, so he did that. He's also currently doing visual effects work for The Green Knight. He's worked on some other independent films as well. And this is like his debut feature. He's been filming it for roughly six years with like very, very little money, very low budget. And it is technically sort of a fantasy film, but it's also like this very kind of rough, down-to-earth, very intimate, independent film as well. The Wanting Mayor is about a young woman named Moira who uh, lives in this town called... I think these fucking names, right? In a town called Witherin, uh, which is... I don't know if it's like a town or like a continent or a province or what, but she lives there in a house she inherited from her mother uh, near like the water. And the, right away when we see this place, it's not like our world. It's not necessarily like full-on... Tolkien, you know, tree talking people and stuff like that, but it's definitely not quite right. You can't tell if this is like the like a post-apocalyptic future or some kind of like long distance past or an alternate reality. It's all very up in the air. But Mara lives here, and ever since she was a little girl, she has had this burning, recurring dream about the world from before, the world before this place, this universe of Anmir, which is what it's called. And her mother had this dream. Her mother's mother had it. Her mother's 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 had it. And the dream, we never really see it, is implied to be a vision of the world before this. And it's both duly implied to be our own world and also perhaps a more magical world than our own that like, we just can't see anymore. So that dream has driven every person in her lineage to want to leave Rhythwin, uh, I'm never going to get this name right, and travel on to a place called Levithin, which is like this icy tundra place. The specialty of this Levithin place is that in Rhythwin, uh, like... It's kind of like a small, cramped, like, cityscape, sort of, like, where, like, apartments and things are stacked on top of each other, but it also feels like a desert, because it's always hot, uh, and there's also, it's, like, near water. Also, there's just, like, free-roaming horses, like, horses are, like, this place's, like, number one export. They never really explain why. <laughs> so once a year, horses are sold to people that live in Levithin, and, like, they get on this big ship and they go over. So one of the most sought-after things in this place are tickets to go on that boat at winter time and, and travel and get away. So Mara just wants to leave. She wants to get away from this place however she can. And she meets this guy, Lawrence, who's some kind of a criminal. And Lawrence is working on getting a ticket himself. And she basically asks him to get one for her and explains why, because she wants to leave. They fall in love. It becomes this whole thing. And from there, the story gets very, very different. I don't want to like unload a lot of plot spoilers because the movie itself isn't going to be out for like who knows how long at this point. But it's a really unique and interesting story. And it's really harrowing, and it's just one of the most special things I've seen in a long time. Without getting too blatant, obvious, into spoiling the movie, uh, it spans multiple decades, uh, and it sort of has like a, a mixture vibe. I'll do like sort of studio elevator pitch speak. It kind of reminds me of the generational trauma tone of something like The Place Beyond the Pines, like how that movie is like epic and spans like, you know, generations. It also sort of reminds me a little bit of like the finale of The Leftovers, how these emotionally charged characters are implying this like larger fantasy world thing that you never quite see, but like it really matches the emotional undercurrent of the scene in like a really interesting way. Like if you've never seen Leftovers, please watch that show. 
Uh, and also sort of reminds me of like Christian Petzold's films a little bit, uh, like very little bit. Specifically his last film, Transit, like the way it captures that sort of like post-war Berlin thing of people trying to get passage in and out of a safe space. Because it's this world that's very ill-defined, I will say. The chiefest criticism of The Wanting Mayor is that it's kind of a fantasy film, but beyond like some mild voiceover here and there and like the actual opening title sequence, uh, it doesn't actually tell us anything really about this world. A lot of it you just kind of have to pick up from context, and even then, you're still kind of left in the dark. And a lot of people have criticized the film for being too threadbare mythology-wise. But that didn't actually really bother me when I was watching the film. I liked the idea that it stoked the imagination and made you, the viewer, want to know more about this world, but that it didn't overstuff itself with world building and make you think only about mythology and, like, drifting off into, like, fan fiction land. It actually allowed you to be curious about the world around you while still really being focused on the individual characters and their journeys. So in this, like, crazy mixed-up world where there's, like, an ice land, and we're in a desert land, and people sort of look like they live in, like, the late depressing 80s, but they sort of don't. Like, there's eight-track players, uh, there's, like, these free roaming horses, there's these, like, tickets people are trying to get a hold of. Like, it's very nebulous, but it doesn't make the film feel anachronistic or strange. It's just all these disparate elements come together to make it feel kind of otherworldly, kind of dreamlike. The early romance part of the film is, like, very malick -y looking. Um, the dreamlike quality makes everything actually feel like it's taking place on another world somewhere. It's actually really endearing to me anyway. And I think that is what is so special, is that a lot of movies take this sort of indie sci-fi, indie fantasy uh, route where they do like a genre story, but they only focus on like, two characters in a room for two hours, uh, and they don't build out the world building because they can't afford to, they can't really like do much visually. Um, it sort of reminds me of like movies sort of like Britt Marling's films, like the kind of stuff she's worked on, like Another Earth and stuff like that, where this is sci-fi and it's like a genre thing, but we're really not going to explore much of that because this isn't that kind of movie. This sort of actually is that kind of movie. It does create really astonishing visuals. Like, it's not like this movie has a huge budget and can do a bunch of, you know, 3D CG and building up these beautiful Avatar worlds or anything. But instead, um, Bateman as a filmmaker was able to shoot largely in, like, storage containers and, like, warehouses with green screens. And then apparently did a ton of 2D effects work to create these beautiful landscapes and these images in the background that, you know, once once you've seen this movie, like, if you decide to see it, like, then look at the making of stuff because when you watch the film, you obviously know some of its, like, special effects, like, they obviously don't have the budget to create, like, these whole cities. But look at the way this sort of, like, matte painting effect actually works versus what it looks like when you just see the on-set photos and the green screens. Like, it is mind-blowing how much they were able to accomplish with so little. And to me... That is kind of the way visual effects, like, could be, right? Like, it's amazing that more independent filmmakers do not play in this realm. I mean, largely because it does cost money. You do have to have, like, very powerful computers and stuff. But, like, there's a bit of a democratization to visual effects software where it's becoming more reasonable that someone could do, like, the bedroom pop record version of Lord of the Rings, you know? And it's interesting to me specifically that this movie sort of realizes that dream because it's produced by Shane Carruth. And when Shane Carruth made Primer for, like, no money and made, like, one of the most interesting time travel films of all time, he seemed to be, like, presaging a future where independent filmmakers could work in sci-fi and fantasy and genre with low budget and just, you know, their wits and their their imaginations. And we never quite got that, it feels like. They're never, that never really continued to grow. I mean, like, it definitely exists in, like, horror, I think, and there are people that do some of this, but I don't think anyone has been doing that type of film to the degree that The Wanting Mare does. Because... It, through these visuals, these really, really, really beautiful frames, they're able to imply a larger world that gives credence to the emotional story at the core of, of the narrative. It really is a story about wanting a better life, wanting a better world, and the types of things people are willing to do to one another, for one another, to get to that better world. Here, it happens to be, you know, like this nebulous ice planet, essentially, on the other side of the globe or whatever. Uh, but for some people, it's just leaving their home country. And for some people, it's just leaving their shitty hometown. Not to make it like a pop punk thing. And it's just so cool to see a film that captures that sort of timeless, you know, vital story that feels so real right now, but also would just feel real anytime. Uh, for so little money and with such a, a coherent clarity of vision. You know, when we think about a guy like Shane Carruth, he's only been able to make two features. Uh, his script for the film *Atopiary* is like legendary and could like never get made. If you guys ever actually want to see me do like a script review of *Atopiary*, I've read it. I could do a video about that. Like, just let me know in the comments. And this guy is so talented and so interesting, and created such beautiful works, 
And he basically can't get the movies made that he wants to make, even with like backing from other big name filmmakers like David Fincher, Steven Soderbergh. And watching this movie, all I kept thinking was, man, I can't wait to see what this Bateman guy does next. And it makes me a little bit worried because, like, one, I do want this guy to be able to do this type of thing, but maybe on a slightly larger scale and still be true to himself and the world he's created. But I don't want to see this guy get funneled up into, like, the studio system and, like, you know, be directing, like, a like a Battletoads movie or something or, like, they hire him to make Crash Bandicoot or whatever. You know, I want this guy to maybe get the chance to have the career that Carruth doesn't seem to be allowed to have. So that's it. That's The Morning Mayor. I think it's one of the best films I've seen all year. It's beautiful. Um, you know, it's not perfect. It's definitely a little rough around the edges, and it is like a low-budget debut, but it has so much emotional power. It's so gorgeous to look at. The music is good. The editing, everything, it's just, it's really special. Uh, I don't know when it's going to be coming out for like VOD or like some kind of theatrical release, but keep an eye out for it. It is, it is choice. That's the video for today. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions or comments, that's the comment section below us for. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you have not subscribed yet to the channel, please consider subscribing. Hit the little bell icon next to the subscribe button so you get notifications when I put out new videos. There'll be another video out later this week, and then more next week, and then more beyond that. <laughs> so, thank you guys for watching. I hope you guys dug it. Uh, seek out The Wanting Mayor somehow, whenever it's available for people. Uh, yeah, have a great day. <laughs> Bye.